It's 7 o'clock. I'm Mark Austin, live in Lviv in Ukraine. Coming up. A maternity hospital is hit by a Russian airstrike in Mariupol during what was supposed to be a ceasefire. The Ukrainian president says children are buried underneath the rubble and calls on NATO to close the skies. More than 1,200 people are said to have died in the city, with the Red Cross describing conditions as apocalyptic. Also coming up. Here in Lviv, funerals for Ukrainian soldiers as the UK pledges more military support. And we hear from the people of Moscow as the Kremlin says the US has declared economic war on Russia. Good evening from Lviv in the west of Ukraine. President Volodymyr Zelensky has again urged NATO to establish a no-fly zone after tweeting that children have been buried under the rubble of a maternity hospital destroyed by a Russian airstrike in the southern city of Mariupol. The attack came during what was supposed to be a 12-hour ceasefire to allow civilians to leave that city where more than 1,200 civilians are reported to have been killed so far in this conflict. That pause in fighting, which was intended to establish a number of humanitarian corridors across the country, has officially come to an end in the past few minutes. Ceasefires were supposed to hold in six locations across Ukraine today to allow civilians to escape the fighting. But as we've heard, attacks have continued on Mariupol and Ukrainian authorities say the airstrike on the hospital happened during uh, the agreed ceasefire period. Local officials said some civilians have managed to leave uh, Sumy and Enahoda, but in Izium, the regional governor says Russian shelling stopped the rescue effort there. No other evacuations happened except for on the outskirts of the capital, where some civilians managed to escape these towns via a small bridge in Irpin into the relative safety of the capital. Our first report tonight comes from our security and defence editor, Deborah Haynes, here in Lviv. And a warning, it contains images of those injured in the attack at the hospital, including children. <laughs> Horror and devastation. <laughs> this was a maternity hospital. Terror for babies even before they've been born. They rush to take her away. No safety here. Ukraine's president said a Russian airstrike caused this carnage and children are under the wreckage. Just look at the size of the crater. Britain's Prime Minister called the attack depraved and said Russia's Vladimir Putin will be held to account for his crimes. For Mariupol in southern Ukraine, it's already a city in ruins after days of bombardments. Perhaps trying to soften its image, Russia released what it said was aid being delivered to another bombarded city, Kharkiv, in eastern Ukraine. The Kremlin also claimed, without evidence, its military operation had uncovered a Ukrainian biological weapons program. They were carried out by Kiev and financed by the United States of America. But information or disinformation is as much of a weapon in this war as tanks and troops, and Ukraine strongly denied the allegation. Far away from the front line, the other unmistakable sound of war. Three Ukrainian soldiers killed on different days, remembered together. <laughs> Comrades broken by a war they're still fighting. And Deborah joins me now. Deborah, is Russia saying anything at all about this attack on the hospital? 
We've not heard anything yet officially from Russia, but it maintains this line that it's not targeting civilians, and yet the evidence of the ground on the ground is painfully the reverse of that. And uh, this attack um, on this hospital, the fact that it's, um, it's been hit, whether deliberately or not, uh, is just a whole new level of horror. The images that are emerging from there are, are really hard to, to look at, even to think about. Um, the idea of heavily pregnant women about to give birth and instead being injured uh, or, or worse uh, in the explosion. And just looking at those pictures, the size of the crater um, that was caused by whatever hit the hospital um, is again underlining the kind of weapons that Russia is suspected of using um, large scale bombs, missiles launched into these cities. Um, the UK's Ministry of Defence has actually this evening um, also tweeted about uh, the kind of weapons that Russia is using, saying that Russia itself has said it's using a certain weapon system that can launch thermobaric rockets. Um, now, you and I have talked about them before. They're the kind of incredibly indiscriminate weapon that um, sucks oxygen out of the atmosphere, uses the oxygen to generate a higher temperature explosion that lasts for longer, causing even more damage. Um, the fact that the weapon system that Russia is using here on the ground includes that, again, um, really counters this argument that Russia is making that this operation it's conducting is only going after military targets because using indiscriminate weapons like that means you cannot be sure of what is going to be at the receiving end of what you're firing. Yeah, OK, Deborah, thank you very much indeed. Well, taking over the city of Odessa, uh, also in the south of this country, is seen as one of Russia's next strategic goals. Uh, along with Mariupol, it's key to Russia's plan to create a land bridge in southern Ukraine between Crimea and the Donbass region, both controlled by Russia or its proxies since 2014. Odessa is home to Ukraine's main Black Sea port and is crucial to the nation's economy. Sky's Mark Stone is there tonight and told us what it's like in the city now. Odessa is, is Ukraine's third city. It is a, a, a key prize for Vladimir Putin. Um, it is a, a vital seaport, uh, the gateway uh, to the Black Sea. It is quite clear strategically why Vladimir Putin would want to get his hands on this place. And they are well aware of that here. Uh, there is a very tense security situation here. I've just been watching from the balcony where we are. Uh, the police stopping cars uh, because a curfew is an hour old now. Uh, checking uh, cars, people coming out, they're being frisked outside of their vehicles. Uh, they, are, they are tense, there's no question about that. Many people have decided already to, to leave Odessa. As we approached uh, from neighbouring Moldova, we saw a growing number of refugees who have already passed into Moldova uh, and many along the roads leading uh, to uh, le leading west uh, out of Ukraine. Many, though, have decided that they will stay. Some states will stay to fight. Some are, are too old, too frail to be able to move. Uh, and so they will hunker down here. Uh, a very, very difficult situation for the people here. The Russian military uh, are about 100 or so miles to the east of here uh, in another city where they have been making gains over the course of today. And, of course, the Russian Navy is out in the Black Sea as well. So there are concerns of a, of a pincer attack, effectively, from the east, uh, from the, the ground that the Russians already hold, and an amphibious assault uh, from the Black Sea uh, as well. Although it must be said that at the moment, uh, the Americans who are monitoring uh, movements of Russian troops say that there is no sense right now, immediately, that an amphibious assault uh, is being prepared. But as we have seen, that could change, and it could change quite fast. Mark Stone there. Well, more and more multinational companies are pulling out of Russia with Coca-Cola, Pepsi and McDonald's all joining them uh, since yesterday. Meanwhile, the ruble has collapsed as the economic sanctions imposed in protest at Putin's war begin to bite. Five days since a new law clamped down on reporting from inside Russia. Sky's Diana Magne reports on the effect that the war is having on Muscovites. Last orders for a Big Mac and fries in Moscow. When the Golden Arches opened on this spot in 1990, there were queues around the block. It was a symbol of glasnost or opening up as the Soviet Union came to an end. 
My father and my mother was here at the open uh, the, this first McDonald's. Wow. What did they What did they tell you about it? They tell that uh, it was uh, very uh, crowded, but the food, but the food was uh, very amazing because it's uh, something new for them. Now, as sanctions close in on the Russian economy, it's shutting its doors. McDonald says it wants to just pause operations and that it'll keep paying its 62,000 staff here. But as most foreign companies pack up and go, one member of the ruling party has warned that the state should nationalize foreign assets, a retaliatory measure, he calls it, in accordance with the laws of war, which, by the way, is a word that has been banned in relation to what Russia is doing in Ukraine. <coughs> Because if on state media what Russia is doing in Ukraine is known only as a special military operation, what the West is doing to Russia, Putin calls an economic war. Fast food, fast clothes, Apple iPhones, you name it, they'll be gone. The ruble down almost 40% this year, knocked further by the US and British ban on Russian oil imports. Moscow's streets now packed with police. State-run radio Sputnik today took over the frequency of Russia's last independent radio station, Echo Moscow. Set up in 1990, just like McDonald's, Echo Moscow was also an icon of the post-Soviet era. We visited last week, its final day in existence. Shut down for refusing to comply with new legislation about what you can and cannot say on air. The, uh, Sergei Buntman was its founding editor. We are uh, professional journalists and we don't want uh, to make propaganda or anti-propaganda something like, uh, like this, but we want to, to, uh, uh, to learn facts and to transmit facts, uh, opinions. He tells me his family came from Kherson, the first Ukrainian city to fall to Russian forces. And when I recognize all the streets of Kherson uh, now occupied by the Russian troops, I can remember by my parents and grandparents that Kherson, it's a fifth or seventh occupation of that poor city of Kherson, for example. But the narrative told in Russia is one of liberation, not occupation, a military operation to bring peace. The last vestiges of independent Russian media have now left the airwaves, broadcasting as they did another symbol from Soviet times, Swan Lake, always aired on Soviet TV to buy time when a seismic event was happening. And that's certainly the case now. Diana Magne, Sky News, Moscow. Well, the U.S. Uh, Secretary of State has once again ruled out a no-fly zone above uh, this country. In a news conference with the U.K. Foreign Secretary Liz Truss, Anthony Blinken said an escalation caused by direct combat with Russia could make conflict even deadlier. Introducing, in our case, uh, American service members in Ukraine, uh, on Ukrainian territory or soil, uh, or American pilots into Ukrainian airspace, whether on a full or on a limited basis, would almost certainly lead to direct conflict between the United States, between NATO uh, and Russia. And that would expand the conflict. I'm absolutely convinced that uh, Putin will fail uh, and Russia will suffer a strategic defeat, no matter what short-term tactical gains it may make uh, in Ukraine. Let's go live then to Washington and Sky's Sally Lockwood. And Sally, did anything significant come out of the meeting between these two? Not really, Mark. Uh, they presented a united front and vowed to extend more tough sanctions against uh, Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin. Uh, but the uncomfortable truth is that everything that has been done by the West so far has not deterred Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine, and it's not stopped uh, the bloodshed of innocent Ukrainians. Uh, that press conference came shortly after the news broke that that maternity hospital in Mariupol 
had been bombed and both the Foreign Secretary and the Secretary of State were asked about it. Liz Truss describing it as abhorrent, reckless and appalling. And Anthony Blinken saying that the goal is to end this aggression and save lives. But we also have to see that this war does not expand and by introducing US service members on Ukrainian soil or American pilots into Ukrainian airspace, that would certainly lead to direct conflict between the US, NATO and Russia, which of course is at the heart of this. This is the biggest problem the US, the UK and NATO allies face, is how to help Ukraine without becoming direct participants in this war. And of course, we saw that play out and it's continuing to play out with that offer of uh, Polish MiG-29 fast jets uh, to help Ukraine, Poland uh, offering those yesterday, announcing it without any warning to Washington that they would give jets to a US NATO airbase in Germany for them to then pass on to uh, Ukraine. Well, that was rejected by the Pentagon. John Kirby, the Pentagon spokes spokesman, saying it wasn't tenable and that it's not clear the rationale for this move. Well, the rationale is that is, is the same for NATO and the US, which is that they don't want to be seen to be giving these jets directly to Ukraine because, of course, they're nervous that that would be viewed by Vladimir Putin as direct involvement. They would become participants in the war and could potentially face severe consequences. Now, Anthony Blinken also touched on that, saying there are complexities when it comes to providing this additional security assistance. We understand the Pentagon continues to talk to Poland about this potential deal when it comes to offering air support. But it's certainly something that is proving problematic. And in the meantime, uh, President Zelensky, of course, is calling for this air support, which still hasn't arrived. And they are still facing these nightly bombardments uh, from Russian missiles. Uh, just one last thing to mention is that Anthony Blinken did say on, on President uh, Putin that every time there's been an opportunity for an off-ramp, He's pressed the accelerator. I'm convinced that Putin will fail. That said, they don't know how long this is going to take for Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine to fail. And in the meantime, of course, the bloodshed continues and this war potentially could escalate yet further. Yeah, OK, Sally, thank you very much indeed. And uh, just to let you know that we're running a special programme this evening looking at President Putin's invasion strategy. Uh, that's Putin's war, the battle for Ukraine, tonight at 9.30 here on Sky News. <clears throat> and uh, sorry about that. As the fighting continues in Ukraine, the refugee crisis uh, deepens here. The UN Refugee Agency says uh, that nearly 2.2 million people have now fled Ukraine. Of those, uh, nearly 1.3 million have crossed into Poland. More than 200,000 have gone to Hungary, which has changed its earlier hardline policy on accepting refugees. Uh, more than 150,000 have crossed into Slovakia. More than 85,000 Ukrainian residents are now in Romania, and there is a similar number in Moldova. It's also important to note that huge numbers have already passed through after arriving in these countries. More than 230,000 people are now in other European countries. Well, Boris Johnson says he expects the number of visas issued to Ukrainians fleeing the violence to rise to the hundreds of thousands. The government has set up two special visa schemes open to Ukrainians looking to seek refuge in the UK. The Ukraine Family Scheme allows family members of British nationals to come and stay in the UK and the Local Sponsorship Scheme allows communities, private sponsors and organisations to bring those forced to leave Ukraine to the UK. It's been revealed that 957 UK visas have been granted so far whilst over 22,000 applications have been made. But how the visas are processed and the time it takes for them to be approved looks to be just one of the issues facing Ukrainian refugees looking to come 
to the UK. Sky's Laura Bundock reports from Lille in northern France. Anatoly and Natalia left everything behind, except their most precious possession. Ah, oh, your baby. Yes, Natalia is 14 weeks pregnant. The day after this scan, Putin invaded and she fled. They've applied for British visas, but won't hear for five days. Uh, we have um, a hope <laughs> that very uh, will be good. Will be uh, will I I uh, get a visa? Yes, <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Are you worried? Uh, yes. Yes. I'm worried. Tetiana is also worried and waiting. We did application. Application is really hard because you need to do it for each of us separately. So if you have in family eight kids or eight people, you need to do application for everyone and it takes hours. While we were speaking, a Ukrainian man comes over. Yeah, nothing here. Nothing. No. He's deaf, confused no. okay. and needs help. The whole situation is utterly overwhelming. It's too hard. Oh, wait. Because I've been there. Wait, can I? I can't. I traveled all, all those places and they are gone. I'm sorry. The government says hundreds of thousands of visas will be issued. The Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Home Secretary are directly descended, Mr Speaker, from refugees. And we understand, we understand how much refugees have to give to this country and we understand how much this country has to gain from welcoming refugees. And we will be generous and we are being generous. But it doesn't feel generous to Mohammed. Countless train journeys through Europe seem easy when facing British visa bureaucracy. If they want to go, give us like easy visa, I can do it. Yes, I respect them rules, I respect all things, but at least they give it us this visa as fast as they can. The Home Office is starting a pop-up visa centre here in Lille, but it won't offer appointments or walk-ins. It's for Ukrainians who are the most vulnerable. But how that's determined isn't clear. Coaches are taking Ukrainians to Lille. Long journeys continue, final destinations still unknown. Laura Bundock, Sky News, Lille. Let's go live to Westminster and our chief political correspondent, John Craig. And John, so the government's still under quite considerable pressure over this. That pressure has been going on all week, Mark, uh, starting on Monday when the Home Secretary uh, was bitterly criticised uh, at the start of a debate on economic sanctions um, on, uh, against uh, Russian, uh, uh, Russian oligarchs, the Economic uh, Crime Bill. Then yesterday, a junior minister was dragged to the House because uh, of uh, more concerns and uh, uh, Tory MPs really vented their fury. It was uh, noticeable that it was Tory MPs who were the most angry uh, the uh, failings of the Home Office. And today, uh, Prime Minister's questions, you heard there, that was Boris Johnson responding to questions from the SNP's Westminster leader, Ian Blackford. It was also raised by Sir Ed Davey, the Lib Dem leader, but there was a Conservative MP, uh, Julian Smith, who used to be Chief Whip and Northern Ireland Secretary, who uh, criticised the tone of the government's uh, uh, statements on uh, refugees. And there is still real concern. Those numbers of just under uh, 1,000 uh, getting their visas um, is still, critics claim, far below what other countries are getting, uh, are processing, despite the Prime Minister saying that the UK's record is much better. Today, as well as fierce criticism from MPs in the Commons, um, there was a bitter attack on the government's record from the Ombudsman, and that's the Whitehall watchdog that uh, investigates maladministration, as it calls it, in Whitehall. And the uh, Ombudsman, Rob Behrens, uh, has talked about how, uh, about how uh, this, in this horrendous situation, swift actions needed to make sure the process of getting a visa is simple, accessible and quick. And he says, lives depend on it. Well, that is... Uh, backed by many, many Conservative MPs as well as opposition MPs. 
All right, John, thank you very much indeed. And uh, by the way, the war in Ukraine will, of course, dominate tomorrow's newspapers. We'll have our extended press preview and uh, news review from 10.30 this evening with uh, tonight's news and tomorrow's headlines. Uh, joining us will be the consultant editor of the Daily Mail, Andrew Pierce, and the associate editor of the Daily Mirror. Uh, that is Kevin Maguire. Right, you're watching uh, Sky News. Coming up, two weeks since uh, Vladimir Putin launched his so-called special military operation in this country, we'll bring you the latest on the situation here on the ground. first move and they've come in firing again. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. There are hundreds of these turbines, but thousands more across Gansu. That's what's left of the North Tunnel, uh, where the North Koreans exploded five nuclear warheads. This is a show of strength at a time when China is more fragile than it has been at any time in recent years. Shrapnel from that explosion, so you can see it littered along all the way. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. The train station and the airport, they're both closed. We're not sure about the roads. We've seen reports that they are being blocked by police, so we're going to try and find a way out of Wuhan. After five days stranded here, this is Deliverance. We help you understand the world with us. Tom Cheshire, Sky News, Beijing. Well, up till now, uh, the UK has only sent defensive weapons to Ukraine, such as anti-tank missiles, and uh, refused, of course, to impose a no-fly zone. Well, today, the Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, said he was exploring the possibility of sending star streak anti-air missiles, they would help Ukraine defend its skies more effectively. Mr Wallace says he's confident it wouldn't be uh, classed as an offensive move against Russia. To date, the international community has donated over 900 man-portable air defence missiles and thousands of anti-tank guided weapons of varying types, as well as various small arms. But the capability needs strengthening. So in response to Ukrainian requests, the government has taken the decision to explore the donation of Star Streak high-velocity man-portable anti-air missiles. We believe that this system will remain within the definition of defensive weapons, but will allow the Ukrainian force to better defend their skies. Well, the Defence Secretary also said Russia has changed its tactics and now uh, Ukraine has too. Let's get more on the situation on the ground. Thomas Moore is at Sky News Centre. 
It is now two weeks since Russia invaded Ukraine, and to give his assessment of the situation, I'm joined by Air Marshal Edward Stringer, former Director of Operations at the Ministry of Defence. Now, Ed, that is not the map that President Putin would be hoping to look at two weeks into the operation. No, and uh, as you can see, the map really doesn't appear to have changed that much um, uh, in the last week. Uh, if we look into the south, what we can see here is that long-standing Russian ambition of a land bridge from Crimea, which it grabbed in 2014 through the Donbass back into Mother Russia. But also what it's trying to do is project forward further into the Black Sea and to, um, and to seize uh, Odessa, which is the, uh, is the, the major port. Um, but what... It, before I go further, what I do want to say is you don't win wars by seizing all the territory. You won't see this whole map go red. There won't be one soldier in every square yard. You do it by seizing that critical national infrastructure, vital ground and the centres of national government. So, uh, you know, if we look in the north, what we can see there is obviously the reveal plan uh, is, well, or was, a two to three day oper operation, a lightning operation to seize the capital, to put in a puppet regime to turn... Ukraine into a client state and hope that 44 million Ukrainians would just accept that. A heroic assumption. Well, let's take a closer look at what this is happening in the north then. I mean, first of all, of course, we have got uh, the, the attempts to open up those uh, humanitarian corridors and they did work in, in Sumy and in the towns to the uh, west of Kiev. They didn't work so well elsewhere, unfortunately, in Ukraine. But you want to talk a little bit more about what's happening around the capital here? Yes, one of the bits that has changed is you know, this thrust we see here uh, from east to west aimed at Kiev, which we, we must assume is directly related to that convoy that we've been talking about over the last week, the 40-mile convoy that's come uh, north to south aimed at Kiev, but now looks very much like a self-inflicted wound. That looks like a 40-mile uh, roadblock that the Russians have put in on that vital line of communication. So this now looks like the, the line of communication they're opening up on this thrust into Kiev, but it looks about two or three times as long as that one, and it's yet another logistic challenge uh, for them to solve. Clearly what they're looking to do here is put pressure on that centre of government, that seat of government of Ukraine in Kiev, and position themselves to uh, seize some form of ground to give them a better bargaining position to try and find a political solution. And we, uh, if we take a closer look then at uh, what's happening in, in the air, uh, we, we know from uh, the, what's happened overnight with the, with the Americans, the, the offer to, uh, to the, the MiGs from Poland uh, into NATO and then to Ukraine, the Americans didn't want any part of that. But the UK Defence Secretary uh, has said that the UK will supply missiles. So it's, a, it's a subtle difference, perhaps. Well, if you look at what uh, Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary, said, what did the missiles he talked about, both had an anti in front of them, anti-tank missiles and anti-air missiles. Uh, those are not a problem to you unless you are yourself offensive and you're driving tanks towards the Ukrainian defenders or you're flying, flying your aircraft in. So they're purely defensive missiles. If there was no attack uh, happening against Ukrainian forces, then those uh, defensive weapons have no offensive purpose. Air Marshal Edward Stringer, thank you very much indeed. It is a significant difference for NATO. Thomas, thank you very much. Uh, you're watching Sky News. Coming up, Poland's plan to provide fighter jets is dismissed by the US. We speak to a former NATO official on the fine line for NATO in supporting the Ukrainian forces.
Welcome back to Ukraine. Let's get more now on NATO's response to the war here and the balance that it needs to strike between supporting the Kiev government and avoiding becoming a participant in the war. Uh, the Polish plan to provide Ukraine with fighter aircraft has been rejected for now by the United States, dealing a blow to President Zelensky. Last night, the Pre uh, Pentagon said such a move was untenable and raised concerns for the NATO alliance. Well, joining me now is Robert Pastel, uh, a former NATO official and senior fellow at the Kazimierz Pulaski Foundation in Poland. Thank you very much uh, for being with us and good evening uh, to you. Uh, I just wonder whether I can ask you first of all for your comments about this attack on a hospital in Mariupol. Well, it's, it's for the whole world to see it. It's barbaric. And, but unfortunately, it's, it's part of the pattern. You know, if you look, it, it does remind one of, you know, the scenes we have seen during the so-called first Chechen war. OK, it was within Russia, but still leveling the Grozny and so on. And we've seen it in Syria. This is the way that, you know, the Russian army, it's Russian's army trademark. They're not that good at uh, conducting what one would call proper, normal, you know, state of military art operations. But unfortunately, they are, you know, very quick to go and, and, and engage in indiscriminate bombing. I mean, this crater thing has been shown now. It's, you know, it came from a one-ton bomb. And that's, you know, between the maternity ward and a hospital. So uh, it's, it's barbaric. That's, you know, and there's, you know, there's growing evidence of essentially war crimes, which, uh, which are on the Russian uh, government's uh, conscience. Uh, what is your sense of where all this ends, how this ends? Well, I mean, various predictions have been proven wrong, apart from the intelligence uh, predictions by US, UK, um, prior to this invasion and Russian denials. You know, what we have seen is that Russians have not won this yet. And that's due to a large extent to, of course, uh, Ukrainian incredible harries and extremely good organization and mobilization. Uh, the other reason is, frankly, ineptitude combined with brutality of the, of, of the Russian military. But, you know, the calculus is, of course, not exactly in Ukraine's favor because Russia is a much bigger country with huge amount of, you know, arms to bear. So the assistance from the outside world, including from NATO countries, which, of course, Ukraine has every right under international law, it's defending itself, it's a victim, uh, is supremely important. And that, uh, that assistance, apart from you know, sanctions, political support, humanitarian support, uh, is, is happening. And policy Poland is, is actually, the, if not the key hub for actually providing this assistance. And we've heard uh, announcements from the UK's uh, Defence Secretary just now. So what do you make then of the Americans being, what, a little bit lukewarm at the moment on this whole idea of putting um, fighter jets into Ukraine? Well, I... <laughs> I mean, I would not really describe it exactly like that. I understand why you're, why you're using those terms. But, I mean, there, there's been clearly some kind of perhaps miscommunication. But the facts of the matter are, A, it's a very generous offer. You know, it's over 20 fighter planes uh, offered for free. But, you know, Poland, uh, you know, is, is already, if you like, at the forefront. And it's, it's a good ally. And, you know, uh, NATO's unity in this is very important. There's some countries who are not in favor of this, not in favor of that, or others are. Uh, so we need to have a, a position. And on an issue like this, if there are questions raised about missiles, you know, the tank and the aircraft, surely there are questions concerning the, the fighter plane. So the offer stands... Uh, and I've heard uh, earlier today, for instance, the White House and the spokesperson saying that, you know, the logistics are tricky. Of course they are. I'm sure tomorrow uh, the, you know, uh, Vice President um, Harris is coming to Warsaw. I'm sure she will be discussing, of course, the ongoing talks 
between Poland and the um, US, but also within NATO. And this is the Polish position. The offer has been made, but Poland doesn't want to be essentially, you know, on out on the limb. He wants this to be properly coordinated and, and done uh, on behalf of, uh, you know, of a much wider grouping and, and also US, who has been actually pressing, if you like, because Ukraine is pressing, and we understand that, for a number of days. So, you know, I hope that, uh, you know, the most important thing is that Ukraine gets as much help as it can. And those fighter planes could be helpful because Ukrainian pilots know them. They are in pretty you know, good condition, I understand. So this is not a spot. This is not a quarrel. It's a, it's a debate because these are tricky issues. And again, um, you know, the, the UK's, the, you know, Ben Wallace was saying himself that one needs to strike a careful balance and was, was, was very careful to say these are not offensive weapons. So, of course, this applies to the fighter plane. So I think, you know, Poland is, in my view, not just because I'm Polish, is doing the right thing, uh, but it's, uh, it, it, it wants this to be properly kind of, uh, you know, coordinated and done in a, a, as part of a wider set, setting because, again, we need to be united on this and we need to do things right. Again, these are the words I think used by even U.S. officials today. Right, just a minute left, but I mean, from what you're saying, you think there is still a way that this could happen and that the American objections at the moment could be removed? Well, we, we, we hope, so. I mean, this, uh, I mean, again, this is, this is about the logistics, the question where should they go first and so on. You know, um, you know the, 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 the defense assistance, it's literally, you know, pouring into Ukraine as, as we speak, you know, it's been drones, there's, you know, U, UK actually is, you know, has led the way. Uh, so uh, everybody has helped. The fighter planes are a bit more complex and that's understandable. So that is, again, the reason why uh, this issue perhaps, you know, has given rise to some perhaps unnecessary, you know, miscommunication, that's how we call it. But it's the end effect which matters. And I hope very much this is possible. I think Ukrainians are asking for it uh, for very, very good reasons. OK, Robert uh, Pustel, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. You're watching uh, Sky News live from Ukraine this evening. Coming up, how the war here and the subsequent sanctions uh, has impacted on global oil prices and what people are paying at the pumps. that they are now engaged with Russian soldiers. Air raid sirens fill the airways. In the distance, artillery rains down. It feels very close to the center of, there's one. They found this devastation to their apartment. Lots of people live here. Quite a few of the windows of the houses have been blown out by the blast. And it feels that it's changing each day.
Welcome back. It's not only the sanctions that have been imposed on Russia that are driving up uh, global commodity prices. Most of the goods that are traded from Ukraine pass through the coastal port of Odessa, uh, where we heard from Mark Stone a little earlier. And with the city under threat, the prices of products like wheat, sunflower, oil and uh, many vital metals are already on the rise and leading to increased inflationary pressures uh, across the world. Our business correspondent Paul Kelso reports. Wrights have been milling flour in Essex for 150 years, but they've rarely seen anything like the impact of the invasion of Ukraine, which has brought Russian tanks to the wheat fields of one of the world's largest producers. In the last two weeks, we've seen wheat prices increase by more than 30 per cent. So now getting into the regions of £340 a tonne, which is unheard of. We've never seen wheat prices at that level. We will need very soon to get flour prices uh, increased through into the market. Otherwise, at these sort of levels, mills will go out of business. In the last month, wheat prices have soared, reaching almost $13 a bushel. That's enough for 90 white loaves. Wheat is a crucial commodity, the source of 20% of the world's protein. This is a global problem that will be felt at kitchen tables. Any serious disruption of production and exports uh, from, the, uh, you know, from this region, from Ukraine, from Russia, uh, will erode food security for millions of people around the world. You will feel the impact in the UK, you will feel the impact in many places in Europe, and especially in the most vulnerable um, countries like the Middle East, Africa, some countries of Asia. Wheat is not the only commodity under strain. The London Metals Exchange has suspended trading in nickel, a key element in stainless steel and electric car batteries, after the price quadrupled. Commodities are the golden thread that run through the global economy, or in this case, copper. This Doncaster firm makes a million metres of cable a week and prices are rising. Even the wooden drums are made of Russian timber. There's a lot of uncertainty with copper. Um, we don't actually know the price of copper when we're ordering it, so we order in the morning and make a commitment, and if the price is volatile, we can end up paying a lot more than what we thought we were going to pay. Um, in a week, 70 tonnes. Ten days ago, that cost us about half a million pounds to buy 70 tonnes, and now it's over £550,000. Rising prices on the factory floor are tomorrow's household inflation. With inflation already at a 30-year high, the Bank of England was telling us that this was going to be the sharpest fall in living standards on record. What's happened is the situation in the Ukraine has made that more intense. We'll see a big squeeze on incomes um, across, uh, across the board. Everyone will feel that through higher prices and it will erode everyone's wages. The Bank of England had baked in inflation at 7% next month before the invasion. The economic war it's triggered means that may just be the start. Paul Kelso, Sky News. Well, as the war in Ukraine continues, the price of oil continues to rise dramatically, bringing with it impacts around the world, not least in the UK, where the RAC said yesterday it saw the largest ever rise in the average daily price of Diesel. Well, joining us now is Amy Myers Jaffe, uh, research professor and managing director of the Climate Policy Lab at Tufts University. Thank you very much for being with us. First of all, just put into context for us how important Russia is as a global oil producer. Well, you know, Russia is one of the largest producers of crude oil in the world, 11 million barrels a day. Of course, half of that they use for their own domestic production, but we're talking about exports of five or six million barrels a day. And there's a concern that either through the conflict or because of sanctions, uh, some portion of that might come off the market. Some analysts are saying that we already have a disruption of about one and a half million barrels a day of Russian crude oil, just from the fact that refiners are not buying it or afraid to buy it, um, both for moral reasons and also because they don't want to get caught up in the legal complications of sanctions. So how badly do you think this will hit Russia? Well, you know, it's, I mean, the crude oil, especially even more than natural gas, you're talking about 
$110 billion a year of, of revenues in, in, in like based on last year. And so it's, it's a vital stream of, of finance for the ongoing budget of the Russian government. Uh, this banning uh, purchases of Russian crude oil, sort of like the last or one of the bigger arrows in the quill of financial sanctions. So one has to believe no matter what governments say, it remains a tool that's on the table. And therefore, the question is, how do markets get prepared? How do governments get prepared? Uh, what countries are still out there that might be willing to raise their production? What is the appropriate level of strategic release of oil stocks in the EU and the United States and Japan that would be appropriate? Um, we've already seen uh, some releases like that by the United States. And um, also, China has released some of its strategic stocks. So thinking about how to manage um, if we get to the point where sanctions are necessary, uh, how do you manage global supply and what are the options um, to either get people to use a little less or, or to get squeeze a little bit more supply out of, out of the places that still can do that? Yeah, and when it comes to the, the ban, for the US, it's much easier, isn't it, to do than for some European countries? Well, you know what? In the United States, effectively, companies had already stopped buying Russian crude, you know, around the first of the year. Uh, we, we were already taking a very small volume as it was. So it's really not difficult or painful in the United States. Um, we have a lot of our own production. We have a field in the Gulf of Mexico, several fields that produce the same quality of oil as Russia. So again, no problem there. Um, we have a lot of refining capacity in the United States. So we're not experiencing the same diesel shortages that Europe has because Europe was very dependent on diesel exports from Russia. So for Europe, it's a much more complicated factor. How are you going to narrow the gap, how are you going to cope with um, a cutoff uh, of the use of Russian oil if it becomes necessary? So how, how does a country like Germany, for instance, deal with this, do you think? You know, uh, it's going to take a vast variety of different kinds of interventions. Um, you know, I've seen some statistics about how much less heating energy demand there needs to be if everybody just turns down their thermostat one degree. But, you know, we, we have a lot, of, a lot of tools. Telecommuting means people are not having to use their car to the extent that people are using their cars to go to work. Um, we have um, strategic stocks. You can look at, um, you, in Germany, you know, you have a lot of homes that have rooftop solar, not the most productive solar in the world in the middle of the winter, but we're starting to approach the spring. So maybe some of those homes could be attached to batteries and that would stretch out um, the availability of the energy uh, to different parts of the day. So I think there's still you know, a lot of different options. Of course, Germany has announced a very proactive plan for their long-term energy strategies, a very good plan. Uh, but, you know, we have to get through the next couple of months is really going to be the biggest part of the challenge. OK, and in just in 20 seconds, literally 20 seconds, how long will global prices be be very high? Well, I think we're in for a long haul. Sadly, the, what history has shown us is that when we have an oil price shock like we're having today, the solution is the country or the government or the regions or even the global economy goes into recession and that reduces okay. the need for oil and the price of oil then collapses. So if we're going to follow uh, history, okay. a year from now, we'd be, we'd be in a recession and oil wouldn't be needed. Got to leave it there. I'm sorry, we've got to interrupt you there. This is uh, Sky News. Uh, coming up in the next hour, uh, we have an exclusive interview with President Zelensky of Ukraine.